Organs without bodies. Delos and consequences. By Slava Zizek. Little jolts of enjoyment. When Pinker deals with art, he proposes the basic formula of this misapplication. Some parts of the mind register the attainment of increments of fitness by giving us a sensation of pleasure. Other parts use a knowledge of cause and effect to bring about goals. Put them together and you get a mind that rises to a biologically pointless challenge, figuring out how to get at the pleasure circuits of the brain and deliver the little jolts of enjoyment without the inconvenience of wringing bona fide fitness increments from the harsh world. No wonder Pinker's first example of this short circuit is a rat caught in the vicious cycle of lethal enjoyment, when a rat has access to a lever that sends electrical impulses to an electrode implanted in its medial forebrain bundle, it presses the lever furiously until it drops of exhaustion, foregoing opportunities to eat, drink, and have sex. In short, the poor rat literally got her brain fucked out. This is how drugs work, by way of directly affecting our brain what we get here is a pure aphrodisiac, not a means of stimulating our senses as instruments for providing pleasure to our brain but the direct stimulation of the pleasure centers in the brain itself. The next, more mediated step is to access the pleasure circuits via the senses, which stimulate the circuits when they are in an environment that would have led to fitness in past generations. In past generations, when the animal recognized a pattern in its environs enhancing its chance for survival, to get food, avoid danger, etc., this recognition was signaled slash accompanied by the experience of pleasure, now, the organism directly produces such patterns just to get pleasure. This matrix accounts for food, drink, and sexual pleasures and even for art. The foundation of the aesthetic experience is the recognition of, symmetric, clear, etc., sensual patterns that, originally, enabled us to orient ourselves in our environs. Of course, the enigma here is how does this short circuit come about? How can the pleasure experience, which was originally a mere byproduct of the goal-oriented activity aiming at our survival, i.e., a signal that this goal was achieved, turn into an aim in itself? The exemplary case here, of course, is that of sexuality, sexual pleasure, which originally signaled that the goal of procreation was achieved, becomes an aim in itself, so that the human animal spends large amounts of time pursuing this aim, planning it in all details, even directly blocking the original goal, through contraception. It is the Catholic attitude of allowing sex only for the goal of procreation that debases it to animal coupling. The basic paradox here is that the specifically human dimension emerges precisely when what was originally a mere byproduct is elevated into an autonomous aim, man is not more reflexive, on the contrary, man perceives as a direct goal what, for an animal, has no intrinsic value. In short, the zero degree of humanization is not a further mediation of animal activity, it's reinscription as a subordinated moment of a higher totality, say, we eat and procreate to develop higher spiritual potentials, but the radical narrowing of focus, the elevation of a minor activity into an end in itself. We become humans when we get caught into a closed, self-propelling loop of repeating the same gesture and finding satisfaction in it. We all recall one of the archetypal scenes from cartoons. While dancing, the cat jumps up into the air and turns around its own axis, however, Instead of falling back down toward the Earth's surface in accordance with the normal laws of gravity, it remains for some time suspended in the air, turning around in the levitated position as if caught in a loop of time, repeating the same circular movement on and on. One also finds the same shot in some musical comedies that make use of the elements of slapstick. When a dancer turns around him or herself in the air, he or she remains up there a little bit too long, as if, for a short period of time, he or she succeeded in suspending the law of gravity. And, effectively, is such an effect not the ultimate goal of the art of dancing? In such moments, the normal run of things, the normal process of being caught in the imbecilic inertia of material reality, is for a brief moment suspended, we enter the magical domain of a suspended animation, of a kind of ethereal rotation that, as it were, sustains itself, hanging in the air like Baron Munchausen, 
who raised himself from the swamp by grabbing his own hair and pulling himself up. This rotary movement, in which the linear progress of time is suspended in a repetitive loop, is drive at its most elementary. This, again, is humanization at its zero level, this self-propelling loop that suspends slash disrupts linear temporal enchainment. The lesson of spy novels and movies is relevant here, how does a perfect operation to entrap the enemy go wrong? The usual twist is that there is another even darker and more secret plot transpiring behind it agents playing double or even triple games. However, there is a more tragic twist, namely, the unpredictable role of the human factor. An agent whose task was to seduce, exploit, and then sacrifice a woman, or a man, for that matter, falls for her and is unable to betray and sacrifice her, so, he just pretends, for his spy masters, to manipulate his victim while effectively doing everything possible to save her. Much more than the multiple levels deception, this is the specifically human complication, what was planned to be just a means in a complex plot is suddenly elevated into the absolute end, into an object of ultimate fidelity I am ready to stick to it even if everything falls apart. The initial move of a human being is not thought, reflexive distance, but the fetishization of a partial moment into an autonomous goal, the elevation of pleasure into jaurisance a deadly excess of enjoyment as the goal in itself. Dennett approaches the same motif when, elaborating Dawkins's notion of meme in his Darwin's dangerous idea, he evokes the example of a vulgar tune that inexplicably pursues us, making us whistle it against our will and inclinations. The other day, I was embarrassed dismayed to catch myself walking along humming a melody to myself. I was energetically humming It Takes Two to Tango a perfectly dismal and entirely unredeemed bit of chewing gum for the ears that was unaccountably popular sometime in the 1950s. I am sure I have never in my life chosen this melody, esteemed this melody, or in any way judged it to be better than silence, but there it was, a horrible musical virus, at least as robust in my meme pool as any melody I actually esteem. Is such an intrusive synth home, a figment of obscene enjoyment spreading like a virus, really at the same level as, say, an intellectually stimulating theoretical insight that haunts us? Could it be maintained that such intrusive synth homes provide the zero level, the elementary matrix, of memes? Dennett is again right to emphasize the key significance of the fact that children enjoy talking to themselves, not a full, articulated speech but a kind of semi-understood self-commentary, repeating, through mimicry and imitation, bits of phrases overheard from their parents. The actual utterances would consist at the outset of large measures of scribble nonsense talk composed of word-like sounds mixed with real words mouthed with much feeling but little or no appreciation of their meaning, and a few understood words. This babble provides anchors of familiarity, knots of potential meaning identified slash recognized as the same, independently of their actual meaning, a word can become familiar even without being understood. This babble has to be devoid of meaning proper, first, signifiers have to be crystallized as identifiable entities, it is only then that they can acquire a proper meaning. And, is this babble not what Lakin called lalang, language, preceding the articulated language, the succession of ones, signifiers of jauris sense, enjoyment? In other words, when Dennett writes that, children enjoy talking to themselves, the enjoyment is to be taken here in a strict Lacanian sense. And such babble can also function as an excellent political intervention. Several decades ago, in Carinthia, Austria's southern province that borders on Slovenia, German nationalists organized a campaign against the alleged Slovene threat under the motto Karnten bleibt Deutsch. Carinthia will remain German, to which Austrian leftists found a perfect answer, instead of rational counter-argumentation, they simply printed, in the main newspapers, an advertisement with obscene, disgusting-sounding variations of the nationalists' motto, Karnten Diebt Bluch. Karnten Leibt Bluch. Karnten Bibt Bluch. Isn't this procedure worthy of the obscene, anal, meaningless speech spoken by the Hitler figure in Chaplin's The Great Dictator? One should also establish here a link with Pinker's idea that humans can directly posit pleasure as the aim of their activity. 
language is the supreme example here, that is to say, it is only through the enjoyment provided by the very act of speaking, through the speaker getting caught in the closed loop of pleasurable self-affection, that humans can detach themselves from their immersion in their environs and thus acquire a proper symbolic distance toward it. Along these lines, when Dennett discusses the passage from free-floating intentionality to explicit intentionality, from a mind that acts intentionally without being aware of it to a mind that is fully conscious, which explicitly sets its goals, which not only acts blindly in an intentional way but represents to itself its intentions in short, the Hegelian passage from in itself to for itself, from implicit intentionality to intentionality posited as such, he introduces two interconnected features. First, such a passage is embedded in, what will later become, intersubjectivity, an agent is led to represent its goals to itself when it is compelled to probe into the enigma of others, his competitors, his prey, or predators, goals. Second, the capacity to explicitly communicate the goal of one's behavior to another agent, gestures that mean look, I am trying to catch a fish. Look, I am trying to escape, etc., is strictly correlative to the capacity to cheat, to keep a secret, to pretend not to know something say, the location of a rich source of food or, on the contrary, to pretend to know something one does not really know, to delude the other as to one's true intention. The capacity to explicate meaning equals the capacity to conceal what one really means or, to refer to Talleyrand, quoted by Dennett language was invented so that people could conceal their thoughts from each other. And, one might add, language helps people conceal their thoughts from themselves. Or, as Lakin put it, symbolic representation is strictly correlative to the emergence of the abyss of the other's desire, Chevoe. What do you really want from me? Dennett refers here to the case of a hare chased by a fox who, when it determines that this fox is unlikely to succeed in its chase, does a strange and wonderful thing. It stands up on its hind legs, most conspicuously, and stares back the fox down. Why? Because it is announcing to the fox that the fox ought to give up. I've already seen you, and I'm not afraid. Don't waste your precious time and even more precious energy chasing me. Give it up. And the fox typically draws just this conclusion, turning elsewhere for its supper. Dennett is right to insist that, in spite of appearances, we are not yet dealing here with the case of proper communication, in which the speaker declares to the addressee its intention to signify the hair does not yet fulfill the four levels which, according to the classical analysis of Paul Grice, have to be present in a full act of signification. So, what should we add? It is not enough to impute to the hair the capacity to cheat, say, adopting this stance even if it knows very well that he is close enough to the fox for the fox to catch it. One should here follow Lakin and affirm that, in order for the hare's gesture to count as symbolic communication, the hare should display the capacity of cheating in the guise of truth, for instance, it should adopt this stance, counting on the fact that the fox will think that the hare is trying to deceive it and nonetheless start to run after it, thereby achieving its true aim, say, of diverting the fox's attention from another hare, the first hare's beloved mating partner, which effectively is close enough to the fox to be caught by it. When, in Seattle, Bill Clinton deftly referred to the protesters on the streets outside the heavily guarded palace, reminding the gathered leaders inside the palace that they should learn to hear the message of the demonstrators, the message which, of course, Clinton interpreted, depriving it of its subversive sting by attributing the sting to the dangerous extremists who introduce chaos and violence into the majority of peaceful protesters, he resorted to the same strategy of lying in the guise of truth. Consequently, one cannot but recall here the old Freudian joke of the Jew lying to his friend about the true destination of his voyage in the guise of truth itself. Why did Clinton say that they should listen to the protesters, when they should effectively listen to the protesters. And, since Clinton is known for his sexual proclivities, one should not be surprised to learn about the libidinal roots of this kind of cheating. William Rice came to the disturbing conclusion that human intelligence developed as an instrument of sexual antagonism. Its main impetus was not, 
as we were usually taught, the fabrication of tools that enabled our ancestors to survive in unfriendly natural environs. T. He more social and communicative a species is, the more likely it is to suffer from sexually antagonistic genes, because communication between the sexes provides the medium in which sexually antagonistic genes thrive. The most social and communicative species on the planet is humankind. Suddenly it begins to make sense why relations between the human sexes are such a minefield, and why men have such vastly different interpretations of what constitutes sexual harassment from women. The notion that our brains grew big to help us make tools or start fi residential on the savanna has long since lost favor. The basic idea here is that, with humans, sexual antagonism, the tension between seduction and resistance to it, exploded into interlocus contest evolution, ice, in a kind of vicious cycle resembling the self-propelling spiral of the arms race, the relative advantage gained by one sex propelled the other sex to invent an effective countermeasure. After males develop new and more efficient courtship and seduction techniques, females evolve so that they are turned off, not on, by the displays of males, which propels males to invent another technique. And, insofar as the passage from sexed animals to humans involves a qualitative leap marked by the emergence of the symbolic order, one is tempted to establish here the connection with Lakin's ilny apodraport sexual, the passage to language, the medium of communication, far from bringing about the pacification of the antagonism, the reconciliation of the opposed sexes in the universal symbolic medium, raises antagonism itself to the level of the absolute. With humans, what was before, in the animal kingdom, a struggle of two opposed forces within the same phi eld, is raised into the absolute antagonism that cuts from within the universal medium itself. The access to universality is paid for by a total impossibility of communication, of common measure, between the sexes, the price paid for the universalization symbolization of sexuality is the sexuation of symbolic universality itself. Instead of the reconciliation of the sexual opposition in the universality of language, universality itself gets split, caught in the antagonism. With regard to deception, this means that the imaginary lure characteristic of animal courtship is raised, out Gehoben, to the level of properly human deception, deception in the guise of truth itself. One should conceive of this link between universality and, human, sexuality in all its strength. It is not only symbolization that is the active element, raising sexual polarity to the level of radical antagonism once sexuality gets caught in the symbolic order, the opposite direction is even more crucial there is no, symbolic, universality outside sexual antagonism, universality becomes for itself, it gets posited as such, only through sexual antagonism or, to put it in more biological evolutionary terms, the symbolic order emerges as a medium of deception that pertains to sexual, antagonism.